Mobile One. When you talk to older mechanics, they're always upset when you talk about fuel injection, especially if they're not in the game as it were lately, but old retired mechanics. You talk about computers and fuel injection and they absolutely hate it. You talk to newer mechanics and they love it. They lean on these things and they absolutely love them because they do so much to help you to pinpoint problems quickly and with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And especially ones like this and this where you're able to see live data. When you can see the live data, you can see what the computer sees, and it's like pulling back the cloak of secrecy. Speaking of cloaks and darkness, <laughs> hello darkness, my old friend. This is a 1988 uh, Ford Bronco 2. The Bronco 2 has a hole on my heart in a kind of nostalgic way because one of my best friends drove one of these. Zell had one until his sister swerved a jackrabbit and rolled it. Uh, but it also is closely related to some Ford Rangers that I've had. And I cut my teeth on that kind of stuff. I started working on cars back in the early to mid 80s as a kid, because my dad was a mechanic and I just basically learned from him. One of the things that I learned right out the gate was not only carburetors and points and setting dwell and doing all that kind of stuff, but the OBD1 era was in full swing. So OBD, if you don't know, stands for Onboard Diagnostics, which basically the car had its own diagnostics, its own computer on board on the vehicle, testing itself and then giving you feedback on what was wrong. This was implemented due to the governments wanting to have cleaner emissions and being able to test and narrow things down. With the advent of fuel injection with a computer, you can tightly control the emissions and have better emissions, but with that, you have all of these sensors and all of these inputs and outputs, just like a computer has. An input device on a computer would be like your keyboard that you're typing on. An output device would be uh, speakers or a screen or something like that. So with all of these inputs, if you don't know, if you don't have a way to see what the inputs are to the computer, there's nothing you can do to fix it really. So the onboard diagnostic stuff was created. But one of the bad things about that system is you have all of these different connectors for different vehicles. You've got GM, uh, you've got Toyota, you've got Mazda, you've got Nissan. Nissan had the computer underneath the seat on the driver's side and then there was these two screw things that you'd have to twist and turn and you'd rotate this and then do this and then it would flash out a code and with this system because this is a 1988 it wasn't on the very breaking edge of when they started going to fuel injection you can see it was a big deal you don't see fuel injection printed boldly across different vehicles now because uh, it's so common, it's the way to go. And in 1996, with, uh, with everybody being on board with fuel injection and there being so many different connectors, again, the state of California and other regulating bodies moved to have a standardized plug so that you don't have to have, like these, all three of these are for Ford. And you can see this one's got a lot more pins in it than this one does. This one's really basic and rudimentary. The Ford system was pretty advanced to where you had key on engine off and key on engine running codes where you'd have the car running and it would run certain codes to you. Uh, but OBD1, aside from having all these different plugs and connectors and having to have a separate computer for everything or one computer with a whole bunch of different connectors, this is actually circa 2006. But uh, the diff big difference between OBD1 and OBD2, OBD2 had a standardized plug and it looks like this, it's kind of a trapezoid. This one can do pretty much every car, 96 and newer, in terms of what the trouble codes are. And look how simple and small and nice it is. But then you've got live data, you have these big old brick ones like this and this, because this does the newer stuff too, newish, uh, but it's the same plug here. With live data, you can get a better picture about what's going on. So, difference between OBD1 and OBD2. OBD2 has a standardized plug, no matter which one you do. And OBD1 has proprietary plugs. They want, you know, the dealership wanted you to take it in there, but then they couldn't standardize emissions testing. And then it was a lot more expensive. It was a pain in the butt. People would have things like, like in the state of Utah, if you spent $500 in repairs, you automatically passed. But that was easy to do 
given that if you had to go to the dealership, things add up fast, you do $500 in pay, repairs, you don't fix it, but then you get a pass for that year because, well, you tried. You know, participation trophies are not a new thing. They were alive and well in the OBD1 era. When I sing Hello Darkness, my old friend, there's just not as much information in the OBD1 system. Case in point, this vehicle runs like this. I mean, look how bad it's shaking. Look how bad it's misfiring. And there's just nothing there. <laughs> So I'm going to cancel that, but it's like, if something's that bad on a modern car, if it doesn't show a code, that's like profound, that never happens. The OBD2 system was more advanced. Uh, there's a lot more codes. If you look in this code book that gives you what this little, I mean, this is like Morse code back then. You'd, you'd do this and you could turn the audio on or not. So you go beep, beep, beep and all that kind of stuff. You switch it into test mode. Okay, go, go. And then you would count the outputs of it. You didn't have to memorize, you know, like E, the letter E in Morse code is just one short blip. SOS is uh, beep, 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 You know, it's three short and three long and three short again. That's kind of the way that this went. So you would look it up by year, and the code in French would be number nine, would be everything's okay in the system. You got all these different languages. But the codes basically went up to 100, and that wasn't enough to cover these modern systems that were available in Cars 96 and newer. See, this is an example. Uh, ejemplo de Codijo 12 solamente. So it's saying code 12 in Spanish is one, and then two blips. Um, so basically you'd have a flash, and then a pause, and then two flashes. And then you've got it in... English is probably in the front, given that the rest of this video is in English. So there were a lot more codes in later years. You can see instead of having just like, you know, there used to be there just like 12 codes that could mean different things. And then there was 20, and then there's 100, and then there's uh, in the hundreds. And then in the OBD2 generation, there was actually thousands of codes. You know, some different cars. Chrysler was the best OBD1 bar none because you just turn the key three times and then leave it on and then look at the check engine light you didn't have to have this hardware here chevy was the next best because you just put a paper clip in same with toyota and then turn on the key and then the check engine light would flash it out no i need for extra hardware or fancy computer stuff unless you wanted the extra data so how high did these go 998 and you'll notice that the 900s comprise of one number so there's really only a hundred here but these are the names of the different codes. We'll go to the front of this, and I'll show you, it talks about like a certain year range. You know, if it was this to this, like in Ford, it was the EEC-IV. I wanna find a year range for you, but I'm not finding it. It was super rudimentary. Didn't give you a whole lot of information, and you still had to have some fancy equipment for each manufacturer. When you go to look up a car at the parts store or online, like say you go to um, buyautoparts.com and you go to search you know like you put in your year and then you put in your make and by the time you get to that there's so many different makes and each of these had their own stupid scanner I say stupid because it's frustrating as a mechanic that works on everything to own everything like this when 96 came around and it was OBD2 dude I was ecstatic I'm like I am never gonna own another car that's older than 1996 because I want to take advantage of this. This is awesome. This is amazing. So much more data, so much more compatibility. It was just cool. So anyway, back to the darkness <laughs> comment. You couldn't even, like you would have to have a major part of the engine fall off, I've heard a lot of mechanics say, in order to store a code in an OBD1 system. It's like you could have anything go wrong. Like this one's misfiring like crazy and there's no codes. So you're in the dark. So you've got a computer that you can't see into. The computer doesn't communicate with this well enough or with enough data or detail or capture to be able to give you a code. Whereas now it's like kind of overkill and that the dumbest thing, you know, like if your oil pressure switches off, then it'll throw a code. I've got a 2009 Chevy Suburban that I've been working on that that's the case. It's not having higher emissions, but they can't pass emissions. They can't drive their car. It would pass the, it, it would pass a smog or tailpipe sniffer test any day of the week but they still can't drive it or pass because of that because there's so much going on I was gonna do some code reading on this and I thought this would be a fun subject to kind of throw out there you always see these memes you know if you have ever done this or if you ever done that or they'll show like points and condenser and they'll be like if you know how to replace these share or comment and that kind of thing 
it's like this kind of a lost art and a lot of people are like OBD1 what was that in 88 to 89 things were becoming mainstream by you know 90s a lot of stuff was getting a lot better but this is like kind of one of the transition years I actually own a 1984 F-150 that was 1984 it has a straight six it was a 300 cubic inch engine and uh, basically it had a carburetor a one barrel carburetor and it had a computer and it was the hardest vehicle to get to pass emissions every year bar none plenum gaskets always leaked uh, the carburetor always had vacuum leaks uh, at the base of the basically because of the vibration or whatever it come undone awesome awesome engine just designed just like a Cummins or anything else but it was gas it had gear mesh gears but it wasn't noisy because it had this composite it looked like it was made out of Levi's and resin or whatever one of the gears but anyway super reliable engine but the emissions on it just terrible 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 because I grew up doing mechanic work I just figured I'd just share my experience with you guys uh, there's a video concept that I'm looking at that I'm kind of flirting up flirting up <laughs> flirting up this video idea I hope you like it but basically me going through the camera and just talking about the different names of different auto parts I know a lot of people would wonder about that really thought about doing that like this is the old vacuum controlled cruise control um, you've got a valve cover I was telling somebody on a 2.9 on a Ford Ranger today about you know valve covers and how you see how far back that one is and how close this one is so you know that cylinder ones on this side just little gems of knowledge like that um, you got your oil dipstick you've got your rag joint on your steering shaft it's like I've got a brain that's just full of all of this kind of stuff I'd love to share you know power steering pump just do a video get on a creeper put a car up on the lift get up underneath of it and just go through everything when I was a little kid and I had matchbox cars you'd flip them over and they'd have like a dumbed down version of what the bottom looked like and I was like I wonder what I don't know what that is or I want to know that if you guys would like to see videos like that please leave a comment below some videos along those kind of lines where they're shareable things where you can share it with somebody or maybe you've got a question or you're curious or you're starting out I'd like to my whole point of doing the Brian's Mobile One Challenge challenge it has been a challenge but the Brian's mobile one challenge was to put information online that wasn't there you know like the videos on dirt bikes and stuff like that I've got some requests for doing more of that but this is just kind of a video I'm just gonna throw up real quick and uh, throw it at the wall spitball idea kind of stuff see what sticks so I'll make sure to comment below and let me know what you'd like to see if that's a good idea if you've got some memories working on the 2.9s and misfire diagnosis let me know I mean this is like back in the days of distributors and setting timing you've got timing marks that are down there so anyway comment below cheers bonus footage at the end